Good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome to the New England Aquarium. My name is Latisse Lathier, and I'm Chief of Conservation and Stewardship. It's a new role at the New England Aquarium. And I've, thank you, I've been here for about nine months, so we're excited for the adventures ahead. As many of you know, the New England Aquarium is a nonprofit conservation organization that has protected and cared for our ocean and marine animals for more than 50 years. We're almost 55 years, we're getting, we're getting close. And I have the pleasure of working with our CEO, Vicki Spruill, who's here in the audience, um, as well as many aquarium colleagues and other partners to help advance ocean conservation and shape policies and practices aimed at protecting our blue planet. So thank you for joining us to help us advance that mission. Tonight's event is made possible with generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allows the aquarium to offer our lecture series free of charge. So I know many of you, not only in the audience, but online are also taking advantage of that. So we appreciate it. This evening, we are delighted to be hosting a fellow ocean conservationist and also fellow diver, fellow diver, J.V. Hagler in honor of Black History Month. He's already trying to get me out. He's signing me up for dives and I'm a little rusty, so I gotta, I gotta get on it. Uh, Jay Hagler is an archeologist and, and a founding member of Diving With A Purpose, also known as DWP. DWP is an international nonprofit organization that protects, documents, and interprets African slave trade shipwrecks and the maritime history and culture of African-Americans who formed a core of labor and expertise for America's maritime enterprises. DWP promotes maritime archeology span and ocean conservation through educational and training programs, mission leadership, and project support services for submerged heritage preservation and conservation projects worldwide with a focus on the African diaspora. By training, ex experienced divers in the basic of uh, the, by training divers in the basics of underwater archaeology and teaching them how to map and measure various sections of real shipwrecks, DWP has established an impressive record of success. Do you have any of your divers here? I'm sorry. Do you know any of the Do you know any of the divers in this audience? I don't know. How many know. How many divers? I know some divers. Any divers in the audience? Yes. Look at all the divers. Well, he's got you beat. That was maybe 10, 15. To date, some 500 DWP divers have spent a total of 18,000 hours documenting 18 shipwrecks in six countries. Yay. <laughs> And through its innovative program with the US National Park Service in Florida's Biscayne Bay National Park, DWP trains young divers from diverse backgrounds between the ages of 16 and 23 as underwater archaeology advocates. Tonight, Jay Hagler will share more about DWP and its mission, as well as the powerful story of Cl Clotilda, the last known slave ship to enter America in 1860. In addition to his work with Diving with a Purpose, Jay is the principal investigator for U.S. Department of Defense Prisoner of War Missing in Action Accounting Agency mission to search, identify, and recover World War II soldiers and aircraft missing in action in the coastal waters of France. He is also a guest lecturer at the University of California, Los Angeles, at Stanford University, and at the University of California San Diego Scripps Center for Mar Marine Archaeology, and an accomplished writer who has published pieces for academic journals as well as mass media. Jay also serves on the following boards, the American Anthropo Anthropological Association Archaeology Division, the American Council on Underwater Archaeology, the American Academy of Underwater Sciences, the Society of Black Archaeologists and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuaries Advisory Council. Yay. So point of pride, point of privilege. I love National Marine Sanctuaries. I have a long history and that particular sanctuary is one of our newest ones near Washington, DC. So it's near an urban area, but a protected place. 
So on that personal note, I remembered, I introduced myself earlier today to Jay and said, I think we met maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I used to work for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and with the no and then later NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanct Sanctuaries. And back then, they were partnering with DWP. So I remember as a younger professional, uh, meeting DWP and learning more about their work uh, during those National Marine Sanctuary expeditions and efforts. Um, and then later, just two years ago, DWP came across my desk while I was working at the NOAA Administrator's Office. And so it prompted me to listen to the Nat Geo podcast that features DWP and Clotilde. So I do encourage you to go out and listen to that podcast if you haven't had a chance. So with all of that, it's great to see just how much DWP continues to achieve, including by bringing diverse perspectives and lived experiences to this field of work. With that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Jay Hagler. Good evening, everybody. Oh, that wasn't good enough. Good evening, everyone. There you go. There you go. That's what I like. I want to give me some energy tonight. So uh, first, I want to acknowledge that we're here on the land of the traditional owners and ongoing custodians of the Monacan Indian Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Albert Jose Jones, a renowned marine biologist, and founder of the Underwater Adventure Seekers Scuba Diving Club in Washington, DC. Dr. Jones founded the Underwater Adventure Seekers in 1959 to give a safe space for people of color, specifically African-Americans, to learn and participate in the sport of scuba diving. He is the only African-American that has been inducted in the International Scuba Diver Hall of Fame. I stand here today on the shoulders of Dr. Jones. I want to thank the New England Aquarium and the Lowell Institute for inviting me here today. So I'm going to take you on a journey, a personal, cultural, and historic journey. So let's get started. Jay Hagler, the early years, <laughs> star athlete, basketball team, scholar athlete, and the best decision I made as a young person was to ask my prom date to marry me 11 years later. On to a career in engineering, uh, formerly trained as an electrical engineer until I discovered scuba diving. The underwater world. Now we have these scuba divers in here, so you understand that once you get under that water, you are a changed person. So, like we said, a DWP has a special focus in the conservation and preservation of slave ships that are involved in the global and the international slave trade or the transatlantic slave trade. <clears throat> so we are really proud of the work that we've done in since 2005 and our inception in training so many underwater archaeology advocates. So now what do we do? Now we teach the basics of underwater archaeology. And what does that mean? What that means is we teach shipwreck survey. We teach how to map wrecks underwater. But most importantly, we teach historical and cultural research. These divers here are documenting a shipwreck in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And we also do coral reef restoration in a program that we call the collective approach to restoring our ecosystem. So what you see here, these young men and women, they have coral fragments and they will, will take these fragments and place them on the bottom of the ocean and the coral will regenerate. This young man here is cleaning a what we call a coral tree. Now imagine a tree with ornaments that are coral fragments. And when they grow to a certain point, these fragments are taken to the seafloor and planted and they regenerate. 
That's a part of restoring our ecosystem. So now tonight, we will talk about two shipwreck projects, actually one shipwreck project and a project that involves a World War II aircraft, the Catilda and the Tuskegee Airmen. So how many of you in here have heard about the Tuskegee Airmen? All right, excellent, excellent. So as you know, you know in the 40s, Jim Crow and segregation were the law of the land. So you know that it was difficult at that time to serve in the armed services. Here comes the Tuskegee Airmen. And so now we do know their nickname, the Red Tails, because they painted their tails red for their, to identify. Now, what most people don't know is that once the Tuskegee Airmen got their basic training in Tuskegee, Alabama, they got their advanced training in the great state of Michigan. And if you notice, this is the aerial cobra. This is their training. And here is the famous P-51 Mustang that was used in combat. So now Lake Huron or Port Huron is located in Michigan along the Great Lakes and it actually has Lake Huron. So now I'm gonna tell you a story of second Lieutenant Frank Moody. He was born in Oklahoma in the 1920s and he became a Tuskegee Airman. And on April 14th, 1944, during a training, he crashed and perished in the Great Lakes. Now this is a team, our DWP team, which we partnered with the state of Michigan and NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary in Thunder Bay. And you see here, a team yours truly, and then Eric Denson, who is a chief engineer at NASA. He is literally a rocket scientist. Then we have Ernie Franklin. Ernie Franklin is a retired educator, but most importantly, he is a graduate of Tuskegee Institute, later Tuskegee University. And then Dr. Melody Garrett, an anesthesiologist, but most importantly, she is a veteran of the Air Force. And Kamal Siddiqui, also an engineer and a veteran of the US Army. So in this mission, you see this is the actual wing of Second Lieutenant Frank Moody. And it's in 27 feet of water and fresh water of Lake Huron. And as we move forward, this gentleman here is Wayne Lazardi. He is the principal investigator and the state archaeologist that worked on the project. And as you notice, he is documenting the Army insignia, the Army Air Corps. Now, history lesson, the Army Air Corps predated the Air Force. So it's a pretty amazing experience. And this is an amazing, this is the actual tire of this plane. If you look at here, this is literally rubber. Now, this plane was found on April 14th, 2014, 70 years to the date of the crash. And when you touch that wheel, you can feel the rubber. It was almost like touching it in 1944. This is a drawing of the entire wing section. The radio call box. Now, the red arrow is literally the altimeter, which tells you the height of the plane from the ground. And the yellow arrow, and we'll talk about that in a second, is a radio call box. Now, this is a closer look at that altimeter. Now, you can imagine this is one of the last things that Lieutenant Moody saw before he crashed. The radio call number, really important. Every plane has an identifying marker, and this is a radio call number, and then on the back of the tail numbers, and they're the same numbers. So, <clears throat> the radio call number 
that we found here is 221226, which is the radio call number for Frank Moody. This is how we were able to identify that this was Frank Moody's plane. Now, this was so important to us that we actually stopped the mission in order to honor the sacrifice of Frank Moody. We had an impromptu ceremony in which we laid a wreath at sea. But yet, that wasn't enough because that's underwater. Unless you were a scuba diver, you would, would, would not see this. It was important to DWP to actually have a monument on land, a terrestrial monument for the entire world to see, to understand the sacrifice of this brave man and his comrades. So on August of 2021, we had a ceremony. Now this is literally the monument and it's literally placed about a half mile away from the crash site on land. And on August 28th, 2021, was the dedication ceremony. And this is a picture of actually the gathering. Now, the unveiling was amazing. It was amazing. And this is why it was amazing. These gentlemen in the blue jackets are all Tuskegee Airmen. They came to honor their soldiers and was a part of the unveiling. Now, the real exciting, our two honored guests. Gentlemen on the, on the right, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Dreyfuson. He's important because he is a schoolmate of Second Lieutenant Frank Moody. As a matter of fact, they graduated one month apart. He remembers the crash. He remembers when they made the announcement on base. So to talk to him, this was living history. And the other gentleman is another hero of mine. And we'll talk about that in a quick second. It is Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart. They both did the honor of doing the unveiling. All right, team, everybody knows Top Gun, right? All right, our Top Gun, all right. And so on that, you know how the movie starts that, you know, on March of 1969, the US Navy started a school to train pilots to become the top 1% to become top fighter pilots. And they named that school Top Gun. Tom Cruise and everybody, and you notice they even have the famous P-51 Mustang from Top Gun Maverick, even have the red tail. Now, the truth is, the real Top Gun, actually, May of 1949, 20 years earlier. And that gentleman in the arrow is the first Top Gun, a Tuskegee Airman. And that person was Lieutenant Colonel Harry Stewart. So he was the first Top Gun. And so this is what history tells us. This is why we study history. So very, very important. And it was an honor and pleasure to meet the Top Gun. Now, they, the movie had one thing right, which was every Top Gun recipient has their name written and engraved on the trophy. And that's 19. 49. The global slave trade, that trade was over hundreds of years from Europe to Africa to the Americas. And history is very important. Dates, now you notice that date, one of the dates, 1807, all right, and 1808 is when the international slave trade was banned. And then in 1865, the emancipation, you know, those years. But yet, Alabama business person, Timothy Mayer, collaborated with Captain Henry Foster to take the Catilda, a ship, 
and sail it to Ouida, which is modern day Benin, and get 110 captors and bring them back to Mobile, Alabama. Important date, July 9th, 1860. Over 40 years it was outlawed. And they did this actually, the historical record shows, they did this on a bet. They bet that they could go over, get these captured Africans, bring them back without being detected by the federal government. And even if they were detected, there were no consequences. So this is to tell the story. And what you see here is a sonar of that. And the bow, which is the pointy side of the boat, the front boat, that's here. Shore, here, river, here. And this is a replica of what the Cotilda would look like. So my colleague, Kamal Siddiqui, and myself had the honor and privilege to be the only African-Americans who ever dove on an intact slave ship. It was a great privilege. We took the artifacts up, we measured them, we documented them, and then we put them back. Ah, this is the beam of Catilda. Know there's a lot of men here, and yours truly here. I had my Wheaties that day. <clears throat> now this is a better picture of the Catilda. And what you'll see is ridges, the bow, the river. Most importantly, what you'll see is that in a space of 18 feet by 23 feet, 110 individuals went across the ocean in two and a half months. Now, it's important to tell the story. William Shakespeare once wrote, what's past is prologue, meaning that if we study the past, we have awareness of the present and we have a little insight to the future. Now take law enforcement. If we know the origin of law enforcement, then we can start to understand the relationship between law enforcement and the underrepresented community. So let's talk about that a little second. Law enforcement started out as what we call a slave patrol, which to capture runaway slaves. That was their whole thing. So now let's, let's look at law enforcement moving to a police department. So now you can understand the relationship, the George Floyd stories the Sandra Bland stories. As an African-American, what we are taught with a license is that when you get stopped by law enforcement, not if, when you get stopped by law enforcement on a traffic stop, the two numbers you have to remember, 10 o'clock and two o'clock on that wheel to avoid a fatal law enforcement encounter. So it's kind of ironic that the city of Boston is the first city of the United States to have a publicly funded police force in 1838. So now, it's important that we tell our story, tell those stories, George Floyd, the Tuskegee Airmen. It's important that we research with a purpose. It's important that you go out and you tell stories for the purpose. So when you do that, when you research for the purpose, when you tell stories with a purpose, then you will understand how we dive with a purpose. Now, the next thing is a documentary that was made by the National Geographic. And it shows you how we dive with a purpose. Mark. Thank you very much. You've been a great crowd. I'll be here all week. Serve your tip your servers on the way out. No. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. So we're going to use the next.
15-ish minutes to get questions from the audience here in the theater as well as online. And we have our first question right here. How should we walk the mics? Or I'll just repeat, yeah. The question is, how difficult has it been to recruit and keep the communities engaged in DWP? Not difficult at all. Um, when you think about legacy, when you think about you know, your history and origin, um, it's, it's a perfect combination of exploration, discovery, and looking to the future. So our young folk, they're excited about diving, but they're also they're excited about they're doing something with a purpose. And they can start to see possible careers on the ocean. So it's not difficult at all. As a matter of fact, we have a field school um, every year, and every year it's actually um, completely sold out, both young people, and there's no such thing as old folk. We are seasoned. <laughs> okay, so young folk and the seasoned Experienced. people. Experienced. Experienced. Mature. So the follow-up is the program comes with a cost. Not everyone can come with a cost. So how are we ensuring inclusivity? And Great question. Well, for the young folk, um, we have the good fortune um, to be able to raise funds through grants. And that's a perfect segue to <laughs> ah, <laughs> donations. <laughs> We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and, um, but all seriously, um, our young people literally are, are fully funded through scholarships. The only thing that they have to do is a registration fee, which is very nominal, $100. And then uh, the rest is actually funded through grants and scholarships and support from people like you. So if you want to take that uh, QR code down, we appreciate your donations in advance. Plus partnerships and other things as well, right, to support the work. Yes, we actually have enjoy a, some tremendous partnerships with the National Marine Sanctuary, with um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the National Park Service. So it takes a village, and uh, this village and the partnership is, has been wonderful. Any other qu questions? Any online yet? Okay, we're gonna take one. We're gonna toggle here a little bit. I'll come back to you and just bring one online. From the virtual audience, thank you, thank you all for participating virtually. How can people get involved in this work even if they don't dive? Key, Jay, if they don't dive, how can we have our community of supporters grow? Well, um, actually, I'll give you the, my answer, and then I'll give you the complete answer. <laughs> Everyone who knows me is that they know there's only two types of people in this world, diving. scuba divers and people who are about to become scuba divers. So if you're not a scuba <laughs> diver, you can become one. But no, seriously, um, actually, uh, there are a lot of support roles in this work, historians, mm -hmm. um, uh, culture, research. One of the things that we talk about is that one of the most important things that we do with DWP is teach historical and cultural research. And that doesn't take a certification to do so. I'm gonna build on that and just say, I'm always saying that anyone can be an ocean champion, right? So we need communicators, we need fundraisers, we need champions of all kinds to support programs like DWP. So I encourage you, I have one back here. Clotilda. Clotilda. 
So as a folk from the middle of the country, I'm a Chicago and I got my dive certification in some lake, I still don't know the name, some lake somewhere in Illinois. But the question from the audience, we have a member of the audience from Seattle who's visiting Boston and she's wondering if they're, how widespread DWP is and are there multiple chapters and opportunities across the country, East Coast, Midwest, West Coast to participate? That's an excellent question and thank you for asking that. Um, DWP has a global footprint. So um, while we do our field schools um, and actually in two, separate places, Florida and in Costa Rica. Um, and that's where our field school, that's our training, but we do mission-based work all over the globe. And so we do have participants in our, both our field school and in our mission-based work, literally from all over the globe. And one last thing is that Diving with a Purpose is, uh, has the honor and privilege to be a global partner uh, in what's called the Slave Rex Project. And the Save Slave Rex Project is an international collaboration that includes the Smithsonian Institutions, National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Park Service, George Washington University, and Ezekiel Museums of South Africa. So think the Smithsonian of South Africa. So through the Slave Rex Project, we literally are all over the globe. We have we in Mozambique, Cape Town, South Africa, Brazil, Cuba, Senegal, and St. Croix, and in, in Alabama. So we have a global footprint. If you're interested, we have several members, instructors on the West Coast, actually. So if you're interested, you and your daughter and anybody on the West, middle of the country, anywhere in the world, come see us. I'm going to take one more point of personal privilege. My family's from Mobile. I'm a Chicagoan, but my roots are Mobile. So listening to what you all were doing, DWP with Clotilda, I learned more. I learned additional information about sort of the history of that area that I didn't know growing up. So I will I appreciate the work that you're doing to touch all of us. Uh, another question from the audience, is there curriculum to support, and this is the virtual audience, uh, is there curriculum to support including DWP's work in K-12 classrooms? That is an excellent question. We do have an educational coordinator. Actually, matter of fact, Mr. Ernie Franklin, who was uh, the, did the work in, uh, on the Tuskegee Airmen, he is a retired educator and he actually develops curriculum for K-12. Um, and so, yes, we do. And we have worked in partnership with uh, the national uh, sanctuary system um, to develop curriculum for K through 12 and what's called the Ocean Guardian Schools. Yeah, I know Ocean Guardian. Well, yeah. Please. So, um, so the answer. Thank you for that question. The answer is yes. So, how can they support? Then, how, how do they get in touch with you if they want to get K through 12? www dot diving with There's the There's a QR code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> Just okay. <laughs> no, you can actually, if you just Google Dive with a Purpose and come to our website and, you know, there's an inquiry if you want um, some uh, curriculum and, you know, we can get you in touch with the right people within DWP. So um, one other thing I want to say, point of we have a person here that has a 11 year old mm -hmm. that's in the fifth grade and uh, he um, was invited to come, but he, he was torn between basketball and coming here but he told his mother about the Catilda that they learned in school and his mother was like wow I didn't know this so there will be a test and he will quiz her okay <laughs> when he gets home so um that curriculum is you know it, it's taking hold and we are really really excited about it other questions from the audience yeah Dream state, the question from the audience, what's the ideal picture of success, say in 10 years? What's your dream state for DWP? The dream state for DWP really is looking to our youth, our young people for the future. And the dream state would be that there would be 
literally a curriculum both in public and private schools and regional training, right? Um, and that training starts from learning how to scuba dive, because that's one of our biggest obstacles, and then introducing them not only the DWP and this work in maritime archaeology, but really careers on the ocean. I mean, we have, you know, offshore wind. We have we have so many careers on the ocean that you need to be divers or be stewards. So our dream might stay is to create stewards. That's what we're in the business of, creating environmental and ocean stewards. So thank you for that question. An additional lived experience. So barriers to scuba diving, swimming. Right? There's so many people of color who don't yet know how to swim to get to that point. How, does DWP work on that first for those that are interested in being the, one of the two people? If they want to be divers or soon to become divers, how do you build up to diving? Well, you know, the key, that's an excellent question, thank you. The key to our success at DWP is in our partnerships. So as we said, you know, with the various partners, but we also partner with local clubs and we partner with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. Mm -hmm. And so we have chapters throughout the country. And so what we do as DWP, mm -hmm. we refer young folk to our local chapters mm -hmm. to learn how to swim and then get into scuba diving. And then the light at the end of the rainbow is coming to DWP. And so we do have mechanisms in place through partnerships, and hopefully we can partner with the New England Aquarium, the Lowell Institute on a, on a few projects. We can, we, can, we can figure something out sometime. But yeah, so that, that's our key, and that's, that's what, it, what we call our secret sauce. Yeah. So on that secret sauce note, I want to thank you, Jay, for honoring us with your presence, and thank you truly for all the work you all are doing. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Let's give Jay a round of applause.